We have a very contentious question to try to answer, which is, is there actually a doctor shortage in America? What should we be doing about training? What are the considerations about where residencies happen, who gets into medical school? Then how do you encourage people to practice where doctors are needed? And I, I think it's fair to say from the notes I'll be cribbing from, I promise I will not be checking my email, but um, the notes on this, that we have two different approaches to this question. And because Zeke is always so shy that it takes him a long time to collect his thoughts, I'm going to ask Daryl Kirsch to begin. Um, How much time are you going to give me, Zeke? <laughs> you can filibuster. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the questions on the table are, uh, is the ratio, are the ratio of doctors to the need for doctors, is it being met? How is distribution happening? And what are decisions that are being made at the educational level that are affecting this distribution and number of doctors? So can we start with Dr. Kirsch? I, the topic may be contentious, but I know from uh, <clears throat> my long experience with Zeke as a colleague and a friend, we agree on a lot more than we disagree on. Yeah, that'll be dope. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. But the thing he thinks that I just can't stand, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I think that there are people, there was a cover story in Modern Healthcare a few months ago that said the myth of the doctor shortage. And there are people, intelligent, well-informed people who believe we just don't face a doctor shortage. If we get, just get this healthcare system fixed, we'll be fine. There'll be more than enough providers. Um, it is hard to project workforce needs because there are so many unpredictable variables. But there's one fact that is undeniable, and I'm a proud member of it, and that's the aging baby boom. <laughs> and the reality is 10,000 boomers turning 65 every day. And when you look at the healthcare needs of individuals by age, they go way up over age 65. Uh, and a lot of those uh, boomers are going to want to lead very active lifestyles, coming out here and skiing at age 90, even if every joint is titanium. Uh, that, that demography, demography is destiny, and I think that demography is something we ignore at our peril. Now, I, I want to say that, that it is hard to do all the other calculations, but there are some facts that add to the problem. Uh, we s did a recent survey of physicians over the age of 55. Uh, by 2020, a third of practicing, currently practicing physicians say they plan to retire. I would wager there are retired physicians in the room here. Uh, the percentage of physicians who are older than 65 is actually larger than the percentage of the population over 65. So we have people exiting the workforce. And we have a problem in that the, the key step in becoming a fully trained doctor residency training, the number of residency positions funded uh, federally through the Medicare program has been frozen since 1997. I, I, this is one of many idiot questions. Funded through the Medicare program, is that specifically to treat Medicare populations or just one of the many provisions of the Medicare program? There's a formula around that funding that we could spend about the next six hours <laughs> trying to explain to people. Uh, you could say, why should Medicare have the responsibility for funding training? Why not other insurers? There is a formula that's linked to the number of Medicare patients a training hospital has. Uh, but the bottom line, which people need to know, is it does not cover all the cost, which a number of hospitals have done a good job of documenting all the cost of their residency training. So we have made a recommendation, and there actually are three bills uh, in the House and Senate to expand the federal funding of residency positions by 4,000 uh, positions a year, which we think is a modest proposal because that wouldn't meet the projected deficit that we see of as many as 90,000 physicians short by 2020. Uh, 
We think it would be unwise, and we can get into this discussion, even unethical, to not try to address some of the shortage. But where we do converge is we need a better practice model, better delivery models, better team-based care using other professionals. And we certainly need to pay people more reasonably for the kind of care they do. You know, we pay handsomely in this country for physicians who rescue patients. We don't do so well at reimbursing physicians who keep patients well. So we feel an urgency around the workforce, and we think there is a shortage that needs to be addressed. But we also feel these other dimensions are critical. And, and what about overall number? <clears throat> is there an actual shortage as well as insufficient funding for residencies? Is there, is there an actual shortage of residency positions? No, or? shortage of doctors being trained who are going to serve this aging boom, baby boom population and populations that follow them. We believe there is, and a lot of it is in primary care. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. Has anybody in this room tried to find a primary care physician recently? Okay, we can have a panel for the next two <laughs> days about trying to find a PCP. Yeah. But some of the deepest shortages are places you wouldn't typically think of. General surgery has become uh, an acute shortage area. There was just a paper out that said that some of our greatest needs, increasing needs, are going to be in cardiothoracic surgery, vascular surgery. I happen to have trained in psychiatry for decades. The shortest subspecialty, the one that is most in need, has been child psychiatry. And why is that? <laughs> Isn't there a very good reason? One very good reason is it's incredibly poorly reimbursed. Right. So, that's pretty simple. So, we, uh, we do ag agree on the need for a change in the mix of doctors that we have so that we have more, uh, we train more primary care doctors. We have around about a 70-30 mix, 30% primary care, 70% specialty, and we need to flip that pretty much on its head. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we agree on. That there's a doctor shortage depends upon your estimation of the need. And, uh, and more importantly, we can't project the need from the way people use healthcare services today. There are just slews and slews of inefficiency uh, that we'll, we can get out of the system, and that's one part. And the other part is uh, we are going to treat people in a very different way with a lot more allied health professionals, nurse practitioners, health aides, etc. So let me just I identify a whole series of things we could do that would reduce the amount of time a doc has to uh, do things and can be much more productive in terms of treating people. So one is a whole series of things that re right now for reasons of reimbursement, for other reasons, we actually over-treat people. And I'll give you a classic case today. A friend of mine goes in, 50, 40 years old, colonoscopy, told by the doctor, come back in five years. Well, the recommendations are 10 years. Not uncommon to have this recommendation of five years. Uh, there's a good reason. Radiation therapy for women with breast cancer. Standard in America has been seven weeks of treatment after you get the lump removed. Lots of studies show three weeks of treatment is equally effective, substantially cheaper, and maybe even better cosmesis. Half the amount of time. Uh, we I know I should know what cosmesis means. What does it mean? Cosmetic result. Okay, thanks. Uh, and we could go on and on. Kaiser has rolled out uh, te uh, teledermatology, right? You go to the dermatologist, they look at you, and they say, yeah, cortisone cream. No matter what it is, cortisone cream, right? So you can take a picture of it, send it to the dermatologist, and say cortisone cream, right? Uh, increased productivity, 50% among uh, dermatologists. We could go down the list. There are lots and lots of places where we're going to actually, we can be much more efficient. But if I may drill down. Wait, just, wait, oh. let me finish. This is me and Zeke. <sighs> then there is the fact that lots of what we do as doctors doesn't require an MD, the four years of medical school, the three years of training, any subspecialty training that we have. And that what's called task shifting, shifting sir, uh, the provision of care to people who are sometimes better ca capable than we are of doing things, 
uh, and letting them work to their highest level of uh, licensure is, that's happening everywhere. It's going to expand and it is going to allow the doctor to focus on what he or she does So best. you mean non-MDs? Yeah, lots of non-MDs. Like? Nurse practitioners, health, health aides, lots of people. Physical therapists, it depends what the issue is. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, in Sweden, uh, uh, if you're a regular healthy kid, you almost never see the pediatrician after your first visit. You know, you see a nurse practitioner. There's lots of ways in which we can deliver care to keep the population healthy that doesn't require more doctors. And more doctors are much more expensive in the system. We have something which we all know called doctor-induced demand, right? If you're a urologist, you don't get paid unless you do your urology. You take out prostates. It just doesn't happen. And so we have lots of data, lots of data, that when we produce more doctors, we get more services without necessarily getting more health. And in the end, health is the issue. Now let me just respond to one last thing. This aging of the baby boomers and the need for more doctors. I, j I just took a look at the statistics. Now, the U.S. does have a low ratio of doctors per thousand population. You know, Russia has more. G Greece has more. Sweden has more. Turns out Japan and Korea, and I think Singapore, have less. They have a much older population than we do, too. It's not about the doc number, it's about how you deliver the care. And what we need in this country, rather than obsessing about the doc number, is to obsess about transforming the way we deliver care so we do it in a much more efficient way with much more diverse providers. Can I speak a question Go ahead. from a fellow? <laughs> the, I would agree with every transformational change you outlined. By what year will we have all those in place? All depends upon the incentives. One thing I know, healthcare system is filled with super smart people because every single doctor out there had to be top in his class or her class uh, to get into medical school. They strove to be top of their class to get into great internship and residency programs. It's a really smart cadre. And now with all the money in there, there's lots of really smart managers. The problem at the moment is the financial incentives are still not quite aligned to incentivize, all right, let's think of how we do this most efficiently. We're still incentivized, let's do more of it because we can make more money doing more of it. And that is the fundamental problem. So if we change the payment, we are going to be substantially uh, I think we're going to transform very, very rapidly. Well, can, let me put a question to both of you. Say that you had your uh, care model and efficient uh, practice management model in place now. Um, would there be an excess of medical supply and doctors who would help because things were being managed more efficiently? And I'm interested in hearing what your ideas of better practice management and distribution are. And then Zeke has outlined all these problems that should be fixed with uh, non-MDs doing lots of care, not ordering excess tests, that. And then I want to say, would we actually have an excess of doctors and where should they be? But we'll start with Dr. Kirsch. I, <clears throat> the care delivery system and the payment system uh, that Zeke aspires to is the same one I personally and our association aspires to. Mm -hmm. My fundamental concern is how long it's going to take. The, the forces that will resist many of these changes are intense in this country. Um, Why don't you name I, some? <laughs> <laughs> how about uh, the financial interest? There's a saying that in healthcare, one person's waste is another person's profit. And many of those entities that profit are extremely effective. He's being, he's being diplomatic. Should if, I name them? That, <laughs> oh, no, no. You, you each Just have your chance. stare straight into the videotape. <laughs> you each have a chance. Um, uh, but, I, but I will say that, that uh, uh, for example, it is not unusual, I'm sure you've seen this, to see a battle going on in your state legislature about whether nurses should be restricted from doing some things or allowed to do some things, so-called scope of practice. Those battles get fought tooth and nail 
every day. And so here's, here's the, the point that, that we've come to. And this really is the ethical question. If it takes longer than any of us would like, we will hit a shortage. We already are seeing shortages in some areas, especially in rural and underserved areas, which some of which are urban. So if we hit those shortages, the first people who will be affected are the most vulnerable people. And so ethically, as we've thought about this as an association, do we want to roll the dice that we can get the system changed quickly enough uh, without some increase in physician numbers, knowing that the net result could be hurting those in our society who are on the margins? Now, we are very committed to pushing our member hospitals, and they do deliver 20% of the care in the country, to make these changes. Your own institution, Penn, is starting to look at the changes they can make. But uh, health care change happens at a glacial pace. Look at health care reform. The ACA started out, and, and you showed exemplary leadership in the process. It started out as health care reform. At the end of the day, we all agreed it was an insurance bill. No, so, most of us don't agree with that. <laughs> I, even, I, I don't agree I with that. even your president that, that, agreed that, with that. That, that. That's a quarter of the bill. Even your president stopped, stopped calling it reform and started calling it uh, health, health insurance overall. But, but my point is, we know how slow the rate of change is in this country. Do you, do we, do the medical schools, do the training programs want to roll the dice? Because if we hit a shortage, we, we do not have physicians. I thought you already claimed we are in a shortage. If we hit deeper shortages, we do not have physicians freeze-dried on a shelf. No. It's going to take a lot of years to fill, fill that. So shelf. first we give, we give Zeke a chance to refute your points, and then we talk about both of you address how we try to start with the underserved who have the least access to mm -hmm. health care, well, well, present and future. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. For, first of all, let's be... Let's be both frank. If you turn the spigot today, right, producing a doctor is seven years from now, you're not going to avert your dire shortage. Um, and so I'm not, you know, we're both, uh, uh, and, you know, if, if you really think there's a shortage, we're behind the eight ball already. Um, I don't actually think there is a shortage. And again, I think uh, what we have to do is focus much more on changing how we pay and changing who we pay, and that will uh, solve a, a very, I think, uh, the fundamental problem. A and it'll also change the balance of, um, of uh, the kind of providers we have away from uh, uh, the super specialized, high cost proceduralists uh, to more people wanting to do primary care. Um, so I think, you know, we do have to be realistic uh, about this timeline. And it is true, and I have to say, Daryl, it is phenomenally confusing to me. On the one hand, we have doctors saying, you know, there's a doctor shortage. We're, we don't have enough doctors. On the other hand, saying, listen, we don't want that nurse practitioner to be able to do all she's or he's trained to do because they're really going to take patients from us. That can't both be true. Okay? It can't, you can't have both of those. So the fighting on the scope of practice by physicians, it seems to me, belies the fact that they don't really think that there's going to be a shortage of docs, and they're worried that those nurse practitioners, those physician assistants and others, are going to take their work away. And that, so it seems to me, it is a contradiction. So let, let me just say, let, let, let me go back to the other issue which uh, Daryl raised, and I think is a, is a real and serious issue. Um, there are two types of places where we do have acute shortages in this country underserved areas. One is rural and one is inner city. And the solution to both of them is different. The rural area, I think, we have to acknowledge no country with a big rural population has solved the rural problem. Um, no country that I know of has actually gone out and been able to solve that problem. And the reason, the moment you begin to think about it, it's not that hard. You train doctors, they get trained in, in, set, in academic centers, typically in big cities, um, and then you want to send them to rural areas without the social amenities that they've come, become accustomed to, with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
it's just a contra cultural contradiction that I don't think you can solve. And I think we ought to recognize that's a limitation. Thankfully, we have interesting, important solutions to it today, given the possibility of telemedicine and that. Inner city problem is a very different problem because you can have doctors live in nice urban areas and attend to the poor in inner city areas. And that, I think, is a problem of those people having purchasing power and the kind of insurance that people will uh, take care of. And that, I do think, is one thing which parts of the Affordable Care Act are going to address. When you have people uh, now with private insurance in the city, doctors are going to react differently to that. Great. So uh, can I pull you back to the scope of question? And I, I don't feel that that should go unanswered. And then can we talk more about rural distribution? The, um, the struggle about scope of practice, I think, reduces to a professional, ultimately a professionalism and ethical issue. It sounds I, like a guild argument from it, the medieval it, times. <laughs> and, and, here's, and here's the problem. If you have individual <laughs> physicians acting in a guild-like fashion, uh, you get the kinds of battles we see. One of the things we're trying to do in the medical education community is there's been a tremendous growing emphasis on interprofessional education, on really, from day one, helping students see the importance of these other roles. But to, to have that persist, once they graduate and are practicing, it's going to take the payment model changes that Zeke talked about. And talk about, please, the idea of where we can change the training and the, I know that you've spoken about the match process yeah. of residency. What can be done, since it's so hard to address this rural problem, um, but also the, the twin problems of rural distribution, but also how do you get enough primary care? Yeah. How, how, do you, well, how do you incentivize I, doctors to want to do primary I, care? Well, I think there are two steps to the process. The first one um, is you recruit people who have a higher likelihood of doing that. So uh, since I became, stopped being a dean and became president of the association, I visited 84 U.S. medical schools. And you see extraordinary programs. The, the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa has a special track, and I met with the, the students and residents in that track, and they introduced themselves not only in terms of where they were from and, and were planning to return to, but how many stoplights their town had. <laughs> there wasn't a single one that came from a uh, town with three or more stoplights. So. Colorado, the state we're in, uh, Denver has, has a uh, abundance of physicians. The University of Colorado, though, now has a very focused program uh, recruiting medical students with clear intentions and some financial incentives to return to their original rural communities, either out on the eastern plains or here on the western slope. Um, so when you look through the schools, and even schools in, in the most urban areas, Columbia University has a um, regional medical school campus with the Bassett Health System in upstate New York. So the schools... Cooperstown. Yeah, in Cooperstown. Cooperstown. So the, um, the schools are, are trying to, to really address this problem. One of the newest schools, Quinnipiac University in uh, Connecticut, focuses entirely on students with strong demonstrated interest in primary care. But as long as primary care is under reimbursed, as long as we have a paucity of programs that give those students loan forgiveness, it's still going to be an uphill battle. So look, one of the things I am, have been, and I was actually in the process critical in when we did the Affordable Care Act, was our workforce uh, section. Um, uh, as I've described it, uh, we took a bunch of existing programs and break, basically sprinkled fairy dust on them and gave them more money um, rather than taking the step back. And, and most of those programs, truth be told, had had some positive impact but hadn't really solved the problem. And we had multiple programs often overlapping and doing different things. And rather than stepping back and saying, all right, 
what's the source of the problem, and let's target what we're going to do on that. Um, we did this fairy dust. So let's that. What is the source of the primary care problem? It, it's I think two fundamental things, and both boil down to money. One is we have ever-growing indebtedness uh, of kids, sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I know the data, the old data, uh, when before it became super, now at one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars of indebtedness. Uh, uh, the, da the data from when it was hundred, mere hundred thousand dollar indebtedness said, you know, it doesn't shape people. But today, I think it's gone up so high that it does shape people's career choices. And the second is how much can you make once you're out. And you don't have to be just driven by economic incentives to say, look, as a primary care doctor, I'm making about 200000 And as a cardiac surgeon or a neurosurgeon or, you know, an oncologist, I can make four, or $500,000. And year in and year up, that delta over a 30 or 40-year career, you know, comes to the high millions of dollars, eight, $10 million difference. And it's like, well... You don't have to only be driven by the money to think that makes a substantial change. And so I think the things you have to concentrate on are uh, those two elements. Payment change is going to put primary care doctors in the driver's seat. If you incentivize doctors, whether it's capitation or bundle payment or other things, to keep people healthy, primary care doctors control the money and they really see their incomes zoom up. And the, on the uh, education side, on the indebtedness side, it seems to me what we really want is a forgivable loan policy the way the military has it. If we pay four years of medical school, you go into primary care, uh, general surgery, whatever, a pediatric specialty which has a shortage, and we will forgive that loan, you know, whatever, two years for one. Um, if you go into orthopedic surgery, great. Fantastic. I'm glad you did orthopedics. Come out and Aspen in practice and pay us back that loan with interest. Okay? And I think that model works really well. People then just decide what they're going to do, and you take the payment of school off, the, off of it. And it seems to me that's what we ought to be. Now, we didn't end up doing that because of appearances of the government funding or whatever. Uh, um, but I think that... Picking winners. No, no. Incentivizing doing more to incentivize. The bill does incentivize primary care, it just doesn't do enough, in my opinion. Um, and uh, I, think that, I think that issue, uh, or that way of doing it, you'll, you will solve the problem. Dr. Krish, I have two questions. You can answer what you wanted to just say. But um, if you could divorce the uh, specialties and subspecialties that doctors are now going into from their future earnings potentials, and you could just have a hit list. Okay, let's quit this specialty. We've just got too many of these. Which would you start axing <laughs> off the list? I feel sure you're not going to be frank about this, but you know, think about what we're really oversupplied with. And then, you know, Zeke has just laid out one possibility of uh, leveling the playing field. What are others? You know, um, specialties exist because diseases and illness exist. You don't create specialties uh, for some sort of uh, market opportunity. They exist because there are real patients who need them. Now, there are specialties that get targeted. Uh, people will say, well, we don't need, we need more primary care docs. We don't need more plastic surgeons. The reality is the number of plastic surgeons trained each year is a few hundred. Uh, it is not a huge part of the issue. So I would never presume to say, oh, we, we need less and less of these specialties. Uh, I, th I think there's a lot of uncertainty because as we are all living longer, it's going to be interesting to see which specialties will be in greater demand. If, if we could develop an effective vaccine for Alzheimer's disease, that would change our workforce needs. Unfortunately, that's not anywhere near on the horizon. So we don't want to start fine-tuning shifting from one specialty to uh, an, or subspecialty to another. What we do believe is that we clearly have primary care shortages and there are identifiable specialties that need to be bolstered. First of all, specialties did not come on the Ten Commandments. 
They were created and incentivized historically in the United States. At World War II, the government gave a specialist a higher rank than a primary care doctor. And afterwards, when the VA hired them, they gave them more money than a primary care doctor. And when insurance came in, they paid the proceduralist more than the primary care doctor. And when NIH established its, its uh, funding for research, it gave more money to the disease specialties. And you became a more important professor at a medical school if you were a specialist and role model. We created a whole system, rank, education, payment, research funds, to drive specialists. It didn't come from heaven, and we know that because they got the same organs in Europe, and they have the in exact inverse primary care doc, uh, specialists. But say that there... Wait, 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 I want to just... No, no, up. say that there are distortions... There, there are two specialties in particular, <laughs> which I think going forward, we don't need as many as we have. Top of my hit list, and they hate it when I say it, radiologists. It's electronic, guys. It's up in the ether, guys. We are going to have a spot market in 2030. You're just going to put it out there, and people who are pre-certified are going to read it, and the price for radiology is going to go through the floor. So that's one area I don't think we need so many. And the second is anesthesiology. So uh, you can have a lot of nurse yeah, anesthetists. You've you got to have a lot of nurse anesthetists. <laughs> it's painless that way. Uh, you shriek in horror. No, what I was going to say so was... So I think the, the, we can start with those. And they're very high paid, by the way. But surely there were distortions. There are plenty of distortions in the system. But it started out because there was a need to treat these people. And presumably primary care physicians were incapable of it. But, no. let's, but no. let's come back to that. How right. incapable, how many specialties do there need to be? Should training for primary care physicians be more sophisticated? So it allows them to do a wider range of things? Primary care training has steadily become more sophisticated well, as the knowledge base. But the other, the other issue, you can look at numbers, but there are a lot of specialists. One of my best friends from medical school is a nephrologist. He says half his practice, practice is doing the primary care for patients who also happen to have a renal problem. So. You Isn't know, this just looking the at the case for many specialties, that exactly. Half of it is really so, primary care. so it isn't it isn't the exact numbers you need to pay attention to. It's what are they doing, and uh, I think that we tend to miss the point about how much specialists are called upon to deliver primary care for people whose main problem may be cardiac, it may be renal, uh, whatever, but they've also become the primary care physician. For but the patient. logical continuation of that is to train fewer specialists, is it not? And have the aggregate number of doctors be more primary care. If your crystal ball is that clear, I want to borrow it. No, no, you don't need. You, it, He's well, the guy with the crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to be precise. You do need to say, uh, uh, look, at 70-30, we're certainly off the mark. At 50-50, we'd be closer to the mark, and we probably need more primary care than specialists. I don't need to say 72.1% primary care doctors. I just need to know that we got a shift in the complete opposite direction, and that's, I think, where we need to go. And um, I do, by the way, I do think primary care, I actually think going forward uh, is, uh, over the next 10 years, primary care is going to become incredibly uh, more attractive. And I'll give you my little calculation. It depends upon a little, I have to do the calculation, Corby. It's a little calculation. If you're a primary care doctor in this country, you usually have a panel of around 2,000 patients. And if the average patient has $5,000 worth of health bills, right, you control $10 million. Yeah, exactly, wow. Each primary care doctor. Now say you got 10 primary care doctors together, that's a hundred million dollars. Now, where are we going to get efficiencies in the system? The main efficiency is going to be keeping these people with chronic illness health, healthy and out of the hospital. That is what we're going to do. Hospitals today in the United States consume one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars. We spend as much as ho on hospitals in the United States as the entire South Korean economy. All right? 
Now, we just reduce hospitals a little. Primary care doctors can do this by keeping their patients healthy. It doesn't take brain surgery to do it. It just takes a little different incentive. No, 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 no. They no. can <laughs> double or triple their income without too much strain. And that, I think, that arbitrage is going to be over the next 10 years that makes primary care much, much more sought after profession. We're hoping that. You had your mouth open. Now, now thank goodness, you got it open again. I, <laughs> as um, a physician and as somebody who cares a great deal about the future of the profession, uh, I don't want to be depending upon arbitrage and financial changes that have been mightily resisted in our country. And I would rather pay attention to real disease burden. And the real disease burden, um, uh, think of the aging demography and think of arthritis. Now, one of the problems is uh, rheumatologists are among the, the more poorly paid specialists. But there's going to be a great need for that. Um, certainly the, uh, the orthopedist. So I, I think what we need to be talking about, while we try to change the payment models and the delivery models, though, we can't ignore the disease burden that's there. I, I wish for nothing more than prevention, but we will still get sick. And some of us will get very, very sick. All of us will get sick. We're all going to die. That's a fact. Daryl? I don't listen. think we can agree on even that. In this <laughs> Maybe not in Aspen. I know in Aspen people think it's optional. But let's just take orthopedics as a really good example. You said we're going to need more orthopedists. They do hips and they do knees. I said the disease burden is there. But let me just say the need for them to do how much they do is variable. We know that it's optional whether you do things on hips uh, and knees. Uh, for many people, it's elective surgery, not necessary surgery. And let's talk about the elective surgery part of it. There are lots of studies out there now. People who've been recommended to get their hip or knee done, where they're, do where they're given shared decision making. They're actually given the data about how their, what recovery is going to take, how well they're going to do, what actually it's going to be like. And roughly a quarter to a third of them say, yeah, you know, now that I have the information, ain't for me. That's a lot of excess capacity, a quarter and a third. But and these people uh, live in a city and the, sit on their tuchus and not an No, that is completely <laughs> untrue. In this crowd, that, do I need to that translate best, tuchus? That best study is done in Washington State, where they're just as active as Aspen. And Goyesha. <laughs> um, Dr. Kirsch, if we... Um, we're talking about, so Zeke started with um, an indictment of unnecessary treatments and cares that are a doctor-induced demand. If you had your way, what would be more inducements to treat only what's necessary? And also, I wanted to get your take, since we've definitely had Zeke's on, <laughs> no, this is on something different, on how well, um, the Affordable Care Act is going to create the kind of new balance that we all agree is needed. Um, and, and how you would have redone it or how you would like to see it amended um, to your ends in the future. That latter question is so powerful, I can't even remember the first question. Oh, so, so, so this issue of doctor-induced demand and overutilization has uh, concerned me greatly. Every time I see a study that the one on cardiology that showed that cardiologists who own their imaging equipment ordered more images. Now, I don't think they woke up in the morning and said, gee, the car payments do. Um, oh, my brother, the doctor, always says, that's a boat payment order. <laughs> but, so that's a boat payment order. But the surgery. reality is, the reality is, um, it drove behavior in the wrong direction. The most encouraging thing to me that has happened for our profession in the last few years, and I encourage anybody in the room to take a look at it, is a campaign called Choosing Wisely. And it was started by the American Board of Internal Medicine. We were strong supporters at the beginning. And they challenged every specialty and subspecialty to identify five things where there is clear overutilization, not supported by the evidence, 
and then commit as professionals to do a better job of utilization. And some of them uh, surprised me pleasantly. The fact that uh, the radiation oncologist had the courage to say proton beam therapy is being overutilized. It's very expensive technology. It's being overutilized in cases where the evidence doesn't support it. But uh, whatever specialist you see or might be if you're a physician, go to the list. In my own uh, specialty of psychiatry, the focus really is on overutilization of certain drugs where there hasn't been a proven uh, superiority of the drug or where the indications are not being followed clearly. So I think the, the real problem of doctor-induced demand is we've got to become professionals again and professionals confront their own ethics about stewardship of resources. This is about stewardship and it's about avoiding harm because some of those people who get those unnecessary joint replacements have complications. So I think that's the most powerful thing we've seen. Uh, in terms of the ACA, I think the team working at the White House on it was unbelievable. They were probably the most br brilliant. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I have to say that it was very gratifying um, that, Zeke, that you took this on and the other people you worked with. Uh, I was disappointed because I think all our aspirations had to narrow as the political process wended its way forward. I would have loved to see much, uh, insurance expansion is important. That's not a political statement, you know, it's, uh, the evidence is there. You give people health insurance, we'll save money, um, they'll live longer, better lives. Uh, but the, the other issues, the changes of incentives to shift us more to population payments are not as strong as many of us would have wished to see. Um, I thought it was tragic, nothing short of tragic, that a simple proposal around end-of-life counseling became the death panel circus. That's and if we have disagreement on this, then we're really in trouble. <laughs> that, that's, but that's set back palliative care in this country. So I, I think the process fundamentally did some very important things, but it, the political forces narrowed it down. Um, I don't know how you feel about it today, but I think we all would have wished for more force in many areas, and more effectiveness. Do you wish to say something before we go to questions? Yeah, no, look, I'm on record. I wrote a book that, uh, where I <clears throat> talk about exactly the frustrations I had about the limitations on payment reform. Nonetheless, you know, let's recognize, one, we've been trying for 100 years. We finally actually got something passed. That's a miracle in and of itself. Uh, and we got it passed despite the uh, Scott Brown victory in Massachusetts that made it look ever so unlikely. Um, uh, and I think whether you like it or not, uh, it has had a tremendous effect. Uh, in the first couple of years after its passage, I think most doctors were, you know, they didn't understand it. They still don't understand it. They uh, were like, it's not going to be that big a deal. Then they're like, uh, I need more information. And now, when I go around, they're like, tell me what I need to do to change. Mm -hmm. And it has had a tremendous catalytic effect. And by the way, I actually think that insurance expansion, that thing we created called exchanges, they're going to have a huge impact in changing how practice, uh, how physicians practice, because they are going to have unremitting downward price pressure on the healthcare system because people shop for the lowest, lower cost plans. 85% of people are in the two bottom tiers out of the four tiers, and no hospital can stay out of it, and they will have to get their price point down to be in those two tiers. And the only way to get your price point down is to be more efficient and reduce your utilization of unnecessary care. That, so whether we got all this payment change in the bill, we didn't get enough, and I'm on record, and I was very frustrated because I was driving a lot of it, but we will get payment change, and we will get transformation of the delivery system through the exchanges. Okay, um, two pretty much optimistic, if tempered, views of the Affordable Care Act. Um, feel free to say something, and feel free to line up at the microphone. I th had the idea there were some, I thought there, there might be some questions in the room. And oddly enough, there are. Um, can, I, can I just make? Yes. Um, you know, again, 
In terms of the delivery and payment changes Zeke outlines, I couldn't be more supportive, but Winston Churchill got it right. You know, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and we are going to continue trying lots of other tweaks here and there before I think we finally can get to the point where we get these things fixed. Question. Um, you've outlined two ways to deal with the need for medical care, which there's going to be an increasing amount of that as population ages. One of them is more doctors. Was You said is, there's going to be a need for that. And Zeke said, well, we could have the same number of doctors, but we could lower the procedures that the doctors are doing and move some of that to less trained personnel. Is that pretty much what you all said? Well, it would seem like in the marketplace, if you restrict the number of doctors, don't increase it, you'll force a movement towards lower trained people doing the things that they can do today. It seems like that. Or you may create longer wait lists for things only doctors can do. And you don't need to look very far to see a national painful example of what a doctor shortage can lead to, and that's the VA's problems in their wait list, part of which, I, I, in full disclosure, I chair the VA's medical advisory group, part of which, in their view, is driven by their workforce shortages and the challenges they face in that area. Well, if, if that's true, then what Zeke said doesn't make any sense. No, it's everything. <laughs> that could be too. What Zeke, what Zeke says is a great aspiration. What I, I have to no, feel, have though, to that pragmatically we can't roll the dice and hope we get there soon enough that we're not all experiencing undue wait times, inability to access services when we need them. Thank you. <coughs> so my name is Kasa. I'm a New Voices Fellow. I am a practicing physician in Ethiopia. So the U.S. has the highest health care expenditure, like 17% of the GDP. So it's, this is much higher than more poor countries. Uh, like in, the U in, in Europe, uh, most countries have 10% of the GDP expenditure. Yet the U.S. does not have the best healthcare system. Many indicators like uh, maternal mortality, uh, child mortality, and so on. Actually, it looks to me that task shifting will worsen those indicators. Actually, it doesn't really give better uh, care. Whether you have mild disease, no disease, or severe disease, you will have better care if you are given by a better professional, a specialist. Now, that's I, such I, an that's optimistic view. It's touching to hear. No, but wrong. So, no, but uh, uh, let me finish. So let me finish. Let me finish. Let him finish. I have to finish. finish. Yeah, let me finish. And of course, you know, the number of physicians, you know, it, it, it maybe just like it's w one physician is for 400 people in the U.S. I mean, it's not the highest, but it's still high. I mean, is there any root cause why the U.S. does not have the best healthcare system in the world while spending 17% of the GDP, $8,000 per capita? Per okay, year. let's it's go not to. We don't have let's go doctors. to. Thank you. Let's go to some answers. <laughs> uh, and it's not because people are being treated by lower trained people and therefore they're getting bad health care. It's because we don't incentivize. Uh, we don't have a, a system that incentivizes treating people, uh, keeping them healthy, uh, focusing on them before they have problems, and getting them the care they need before uh, things develop. Doctors and the healthcare system do what they're paid to do. They will go out of business if they do things that they're not paid to do. We've all experienced this by, you know, we can't communicate with our doctor with email. Um, and the fact of the matter is, we have incentivized the wrong kind of behaviors. And that is the root cause of our problem. We also have heavily relied on hospitals and the most high-tech aspect of the hospital. So we have more ICU beds per person than any place else in the world. You know, and when people get sick, we put them in the ICU uh, in, instead of trying to prevent them from getting sick in, into the hospital. Dr. This Kirsch. This is not about we don't have enough doctors and they're treated by people who are unqualified to care for them. I, j I just attended a meeting in Europe and we had this discussion. On. And uh, what the Europeans actually understand and talk about more than we do 
is the outcomes in the U.S., the poor outcomes, are not evenly distributed. We have health disparities. If you went to the tent and saw the calculator where you could put in your zip code, we could have done the same thing around infant mortality, uh, a lot of other health outcomes. Part of our problem is we've been very willing to invest, spend, in some ways spend too much in some aspects of health care. And we have woefully underinvested in education, social programs. And if you want to know where the poor outcomes reside in this country, it's the people who have been disadvantaged in education who are poor. And our, our real, I believe the root cause of this is not addressing those disparities and those causes of poverty and poor education. And that's what your country and others are realizing, which is why you try, as best you can with your limited resources, invest in those things. It will improve your health. Zeke, I was, uh, I and some other people were very disappointed that in, in the uh, Affordable Care Act, nothing addressed the malpractice issues in the United States. In Illinois, we have a very severe problem versus the state of Wisconsin, which you know has controls over it. And in fact, in Northern Illinois, Rockford or Waukegan or whatever, there's no physicians practicing in high risk areas. They all moved across the border. Obviously, there's a very big block of attorneys who specialize in malpractice. Now, there's some severe issues that happen. There should be some malpractice issues. What happened in the discussions with malpractice? Other than I know there are big contributors. Um, so, Gordon, <laughs> uh, I'll be shameless. I, I detail in my book, first, uh, the problem with the malpractice system, which I think it deserves attention. It, it, it's broken from any angle, whether you're a patient, uh, you're a doc, uh, you want to incentivize high quality care. The whole thing is for cocked, as my grandmother would say. It's just completely dysfunctional, um, uh, and it's a lottery. You know, if you're in some parts of Texas, Illinois, a few other places, uh, you get good. Um, and frankly, the malpractice thing is all about politics, and I detail in the book the political situation. And as uh, uh, I also detail, and uh, let me just, that the White House had several of us strongly working for malpractice reform. We wrote a very detailed <coughs> analysis of malpractice reform and the option. We had a president who as senator introduced a bill on malpractice reform, himself committed to malpractice reform. In fact, we have, we in the Obama administration did more on malpractice than any other administration. We have several pilot programs that no one else even started, co strongly committed to it. And it is all about politics. And there's just two groups to blame on this. Group number one, Republicans. If they had come to the table and they had said, all right, you know, this is politics, we're going to cut the sausage, we're, you know, and we want malpractice reform in for it. In a heartbeat, there would have been malpractice reform in there. Could and I? the second group was the AMA. Yes. And I detail a discussion I had in my brother's office with him about this and his exact words about it. Yes, in public, malpractice is very important, very important. In the discussions when you're cutting the sausage, it was all about payment and the SGR, payment and the SGR, and malpractice was not at the top of the list, and therefore, there wasn't a need to put it in the bill, alienate a base, and the president took a lot of help alienating lots of bases to get the bill passed, the labor unions and lots of others. He had provisions that they didn't like. Politics didn't line up, and that is the facts. Could I? I, I don't know if you're a physician, Gordon. But there's, there's a dimension to this that when I speak to physician groups uh, concerns me because often somebody will say, I'll think about these other things when you fix the malpractice system. I agree with you. And there actually was a survey of several thousand doctors last summer published. The mm -hmm. strong majority of the doctors, when they're asked the question, who bears major responsibility for health care cost, the number one choice for a strong majority were trial lawyers. A majority of them blamed patients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only 30% said doctors bore major responsibility. So this is another professional issue for us that we need to come to terms that while malpractice is an issue, we've got to accept our share of the problem too, professionally. 
Thanks for both answers. Mike McCready, I've practiced as a primary care doctor for 25 years in a small town in Texas. I'm now a hospitalist. One of the biggest issues I see and I hear all the time from my colleagues uh, is that we have not achieved any simplification of documentation and of uh, the flow of information in our offices despite computerizing everything uh, and spending a lot of government's money to do that. When are we going to force uh, a simplification in documentation so the doctors don't spend half their time writing and half their time seeing patients? And when are the uh, simplifications and the, um, the, the making everybody do it the same in the insurance products going to actually come to fruition uh, so that we can become more efficient? I've, I've practiced a long time. I see about a third less patients now than I used to because I can't do it but, and do all the other things that I say, if, if it ain't doctoring, I don't want to do it. And somebody else needs to be able to do that. But it all falls back to the primary care doctor's plate. And therefore, he can't do, he and she can't do as much work to be able to meet. And I think Zeke's right. If we were just doctoring, we, is, could, we could meet that This demand. is such a strong counter incentive to training primary care doctors, plus it's driving incipient doctors out of the profession. Mm -hmm. So it's so good that you named that problem. Let's start with Dr. Kirsch, then Zeke. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, even though they're, they're on the political hot seat now, the first large system, a very large system, to develop a uniform electronic record was the VA. And our students and residents, who many of whom train there, really enjoy the fact that they have that system. And it was proven, the advantage of it was really proven. The acid test was Katrina. Because when all those patients were dispersed, the one group of patients that could get their records and their medications immediately were the VA patients. So for all the heat the VA is taking about its bureaucratic missteps, it has shown us the power of a uniform record. So um, <clears throat> this is something I worked hard on, and I do, the bill does have some stuff on administrative simplification, nowhere near enough, but that it has anything, uh, uh, I will take partial credit for that, along with a few, a, a very small number of other people who we banged our head against the wall. It's not perfect at all because one of the things it, first of all, doesn't empower someone whose job it is every morning to wake up and do exactly what you said. We wanted that and it didn't get in the bill, which is we need a chief paperwork person who every day ha both has the authority and is committed to simplifying things. And second of all, the bill also has this problem in that the requirement on the uh, administrative simplification falls on payers and doesn't require doctors and hospitals to adopt them, and payers therefore are, you know, not fully into it because they're worried we will build it, they will not come. Um, this is an area which there are, you know, probably thirty billion dollars a year. Um, the cost for uh, processing a claim in the medical side is seven fifty on average. You know, your Mastercard, it's two cents. Um, why they get two and a half percent of sales, I don't know, but it's two cents. And we need to get, we're not going to get to two cents, we're, you know, going to, but if we settled out at a buck, mm -hmm. it would be unbelievable because it would have been efficient. We had a very long list of things we wanted. That anything's in there is a minor miracle for this reason. Turns out that most of that administrative savings does not, hardly any of it accrues to the government. It all is private sector, 50% to providers and uh, most of the remaining part to payers. And therefore putting it in, but no one else can bring everyone together. Why do we have ATMs that work so well? Sure, no, you have to stop, 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 stop. Um, try, no, we have to stop, because we're <laughs> actually out of time, but I'm going to ask for two more questions consecutively, and let's try to, in lightning round fashion, answer Not possible. two more. State medical boards are resisting telemedicine. What do we do? You don't mention state medical boards, but as you look at providing care across the country and I'm on a board of a telemedicine company, it's a nightmare when we're providing great service. Okay. Hey, maybe I can make it more of a comment than a question. I'm Tara no, Montgomery. No, you can't. <laughs> Tara Montgomery, um, I lead Health at Consumer Reports. I want to thank you for us saying Choosing Wisely. We co-sponsored Choosing Wisely's origins and what you said about waste is so true and what you said about radiology is so true because of the 300 items on the Choosing Wisely list, about half of them are radiology. And another item which you didn't mention and I wanted to ask you about was the annual physical. 
which it turns out is unnecessary, and so is going and asking for antibiotics. So as Do you have any so, comments on with that? With so many of the topics that have been mentioned, Zeke has written a column about this. So you can look up Zeke's column about annual physicals. And Dr. Kerr, should you have any reply to either of those two? Uh, just look up Choosing Wisely. It'll, it'll warm your heart. Um, so I have to apologize for such lackadaisical um, <laughs> commenters here. We actually and, like each other. An unengaged <laughs> audience. But that makes for the best panels <laughs> contention. And um, I, I'm so glad that Zeke has identified how to cut all costs through all of that unnecessary anesthesia we've been administering. <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, too. <laughs>